Great. Mercury Atlas 7, then. Fourth crewed Mercury flight, if I'm remembering that correctly. Indeed. 24th of May, 1962. Quite a day. Scott Carpenter. Aurora 7, 18th Mercury spacecraft. Six human in space, actually. Quite the club to be a part of back then. So three orbits this mission. We're going in deep today, aren't we? Objectives, the flight, and, well, that landing. We got detailed timelines, the official reports, even some of Carpenter's own writing on it. She give us some good insight. Multiple angles. Really build a picture of what happened. Now, Carpenter wasn't the first choice, was he? Deke Slayton was meant to be in that seat. Ah, that's right. Slayton was down for it. During a routine centrifuge session, they found a cardiac dysrhythmia. Irregular heartbeat, essentially. Not something you want popping up mid-flight. Grounded him, sadly. So Slayton out. But instead of Shira, who was his backup, they went for Carpenter. He'd backed up Glenn on Mercury Atlas 6. Seen as the most ready, I suppose. Yes. Been right there with Glenn through all the prep. Knew the mission inside and out. And Slayton had already named his craft Delta 7. Fourth crewed flight, simple enough. Bit on the nose, maybe. Carpenter went for Aurora 7, didn't he? Bit more flair there. Multifaceted reasoning, actually. Mm. Open skies. That new dawn of space travel. The 7, naturally, for the Mercury 7. But he did mention later, it was also his childhood address, Aurora Avenue, 7th Street, in Boulder, Colorado. Though he admitted that Link only struck him after he'd chosen the name. Well, that's a nice coincidence. Adds a bit of, well, human touch to it all. Indeed. Right. Pilot sorted, craft christened. What were they aiming for with this one? More shakedown of the Mercury systems. Partly, yes. Longer flight, building confidence in those systems for extended missions. But the real meat of it, so to speak, was the scientific experiments. Totally on what Glenn did, but with their own unique set of goals. Right, into the nuts and bolts then. The Atlas rocket, Aurora 7 itself, much different from what Glenn flew on. Some tweaks. The Atlas booster, 107D, they kept the insulation blanket on the tank bulkhead. They were going to remove it on later ones, figured it wasn't needed, but stuck with it for this one, just in case. What else on the rocket front? LOX, tank skin. They thickened it further on the 107D, the capsules were getting heavier, longer missions, more on board. Needed the extra strength. Makes sense. When did these components arrive at the Cape? Ready to go. Aurora 7 itself, back in November 61. The Alice booster, March 62, fresh from the conveyor factory. Now, weren't there some worries about the Atlas at this point? Other programs having a few, shall we say, unscheduled disassemblies? <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. After Glenn's flight, a couple of hiccups, 11F, 1F, right. and that first Atlas Centaur launch, Caused a bit of a stir. They convened the Flight Safety Review Board to have a good look. And the verdict. Big threat to Mercury Atlas 7. They reckoned it was mostly down to quality control on those other programs. Not so much a systemic problem. And the Mercury program. Much stricter controls, better oversight. Plus that three-second hold down, different engine start. All meant those rough combustion issues they thought some Atlases had were less likely here. The Centaur. Well, that was the upper stage, wasn't it? Not the Atlas itself. So, calculated risk then. Believed their procedures were good enough? Exactly. Sent itself all smooth sailing? Pretty much. Booster performed admirably. Aurora 7, right on target for orbit. One little blip, though. Sustainer engine hydraulic switch showed a pressure loss at 265 seconds. Flipped to the abort position. Blimey, that sounds a bit close for comfort. Why didn't it, well, abort? Thankfully, the ASIS, the abort system, needed two of those switches to trip. And the other data? All fine. Hydraulics working as they should. Reckoned it was just the cold from the LOX lines playing havoc with the sensor. Makes you think, doesn't it? All those early flights, one sensor reading away from disaster? Quite. Did they uh, fix that for the next flights then? Oh, yeah. Bit of thermal insulation around those switches from then on. Lesson learned, I suppose. Key timings then. Pico, Seco, all that. Pico at 124 seconds, Seco at 305, Aurora 7 in orbit. 17,547 miles per hour, 7,844 meters per second, if you prefer. Right, zipping along then. Any changes on Aurora 7 itself? A few. They'd had that premature drogue deployment on the previous flight. So Carpenter and the crew, they suggested some changes to the periscope, the drogue system itself. Avoid that happening again. And they added a low-level commutator, basically a whole bunch more sensors, measuring temperature at 28 points around the spacecraft, really getting a detailed picture of the thermal environment. Data, data, data. Absolutely. Right, up in orbit. What were they actually trying to do up there science-wise? Right, so big focus on this one was liquids in zero G. Carpenter had a sealed glass bottle, observing how the liquid inside behaved. 
proper science. Seems simple enough. It's fundamental though, isn't it? Fluid dynamics and microgravity, still important today, designing space stations, all that. True. What else on the to-do list? Photography. They wanted a good look at Earth's weather patterns, so Carpenter had cameras for that. Plus, he got 19 photos of the setting sun, the flattened sun from orbit. Quite something, I'd imagine. I bet any ground-based stuff, coordinating with folks back home. They tried to get him to observe a flare from the ground. He had a special light meter. Sadly, didn't work out. Happens sometimes, eh? Science isn't always predictable. What was that balloon experiment, then? Sounded a bit out there. That was interesting. Tethered balloon. 30-inch Mylar sphere. Mm -hmm. Five colors on a 100-foot nylon line. They wanted to see how space affected the colors, reflectivity, and all that. Plus, they had a strain gauge to measure the drag. Partially successful, they said. Partially? What went wrong? Sources don't say exactly. Maybe mm -hmm. didn't deploy properly, or they didn't get all the data they hoped for. Bit of a mystery. And Carpenter himself, he had specific training for one observation, right? Something to do with the atmosphere. Yes, the air glow layer. That faint light in the upper atmosphere. Glenn had seen it, so they wanted Carpenter to have another look. He got specific training for that. Busy guy up there. Anything else he reported seeing? Anything unusual? Well, he saw the fireflies. Mm. Glenn had reported those too. Carpenter, he described them more like snowflakes, though. Different sizes, brightness, colors. Even one that looked like a, a helical shaving, he said. What were they then? Some sort of space dust. Figured it out on his third orbit by accident. <laughs> Bumped his hand on the cabin wall. A bunch of them appeared outside. Turns out it was ice particles shaking loose from the spacecraft. Right, so just bits of frost. Solved it by bumping his elbow. Exactly. Bit of an unintentional experiment. Right. What about the, the less exciting stuff? Food, all that. They moved on from the tubes, didn't they? They did. Yeah. First, solid food in space. Freeze-dried cubes in a plastic bag. Not quite a banquet. And, well, they had problems with crumbs. What? Bits of space food floating about? It seems the cubes were coated to stop them crumbling. But that coating might have got damaged before launch. Carpenter said there were crumbs everywhere, worried they'd get sucked into the air intakes or he'd choke on them. Sounds messy. And to top it off, the cabin got quite toasty. 39 Celsius, 102 Fahrenheit, melted his chocolate bar. By the second orbit, he'd pretty much given up on eating. Not a great culinary experience then. Beyond the science and the snacks, any major technical issues crop up while he was in orbit? One rather big one. The pitch horizon scanner went on the fritz. Key bit of kit, that. Part of the automatic control system keeps the spacecraft pointing the right way. Not good. What did he do? Luckily, he could control it manually. Use his own observations, kept things on track. Training paid off there. Makes you appreciate the skills those early astronauts needed, doesn't it? Not just riding a rocket. Absolutely. Last thing on the orbital phase. Views of Earth. Any good. Patchy. Lots of cloud cover. Got some decent looks at the southwestern U.S. and western Africa. But when he passed over Florida, completely socked in. Shame. <laughs> All right. So a mixed bag up there. Now re-entry, the landing. Bit of a uh, miscalculation there. That's putting it mildly. Landed 250 miles, 400 kilometers off target. Quite a way off. Shows you, even with all the planning, human error, liberal oversights can have massive consequences. And we've got a whole list of contributing factors, don't we? Where did it all start to unravel? Well, Carpenter himself admitted he started the landing prep a bit late. Said he was distracted watching those fireflies on the last orbit. Meant he was a bit rushed. Fascinating sight, but maybe not the best timing? Quite. Then, when he went to engage the automatic systems for retrofire, things got sticky. Oh, so? That automatic stabilization system wouldn't hold the right attitude. 34 degrees pitch, zero yaw, what they needed for the retrofire. Had to use other controls. And it was during this switching bout, wasn't it, that a crucial mistake was made? Yes. When he moved to fly-by-wire control, he forgot to disengage the manual system. So for 10 minutes, both systems were running at once, guzzling fuel. 10 minutes? That must have eaten into the reserves. Hugely. Limited his ability to make corrections later on. Yeah. And, well, you can bet they changed procedures after that. I should think so. Then there's a retrofire attitude itself. Which way the spacecraft was pointing when they fired the rockets? That was off too, wasn't it? It was. Carpenter said his instruments and what he was seeing out the window, they didn't match up. So he went with what he could see. Problem was, Aurora 7 was pointing 25 degrees to the right of where it should have been. Big difference. Pushing him further off course right from the start. Exactly. 
And then to add to it, he fired the retro rockets three seconds late. Ah, uh, much sure. At those speeds, even three seconds is 15 miles, 24 kilometers out. All these little errors adding up. So already off course, no fuel to correct. Any chance of saving it at this point? Well, after retrofire, the fuel gauges showed some left in both the automatic and manual tanks. Carpenter was going to use the manual fuel to try and get the right re-entry attitude, but then he found out the manual gauge was faulty. Empty tank. Oh dear. No last-minute heroics then. So, splashdown. Where did he end up? Took them nearly an hour to find him. Northeast of Puerto Rico. USS Farragut got there first, about 40 minutes after splashdown. Then helicopters from the Intrepid, they picked him up. The John R. Pierce eventually towed Aurora 7 to Roosevelt Roads in Puerto Rico. Imagine that, bobbing about for an hour after all that. How was he, physically? A bit tired, I'd imagine. But otherwise, fit as a fiddle. No ill effects from the bumpy ride. Well, that's good at least. But professionally, this wasn't good for Carpenter, was it? Chris Kraft, the flight director, wasn't a happy bunny. Happy isn't quite the word. He was furious. <sighs> Blamed Carpenter for wasting that fuel, said that's what caused the landing error. And that was that for Carpenter's space career, wasn't it? Pretty much. Never got another mission. Left NASA in 64, joined the Navy's Sea Lab program. Bit of a change of scenery. What about Aurora 7 herself? Museum piece now. Oh, yeah. Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Quite the exhibit. Right, let's run through that timeline again, just to be sure we've got it all. Certainly. Launch, 7.45 a.m. Eastern Time. Biko, 124 seconds. Seco, 3.05. Separation not long after that. Retrofire, 4 hours, 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Drogue shoot, 4.50.20. Main shoot, 4.51.55. Splashdown, 4.57.10. All there, more or less. So, Mercury Atlas 7. Got the science done, lots of data, but that landing, eh? Bit of a black mark. It does rather overshadow things, doesn't it? But it's a great case study. How complex these missions were, are. All the text, the human element, tiny things going wrong, cascading to the big problems. All those little mistakes piling up, sending hundreds of kilometers off course. Makes you think. It does. But let's not forget, this mission, it did a lot of good. First, important data. Shows both the triumph and the risk of pushing those boundaries going into space. Absolutely. It really makes you wonder what other little things in all that complexity could have huge knock-on effects. Bit worrying when you think about it. Fantastic deep dive, though. Really gets you thinking. Glad you enjoyed it. Thank you. My pleasure.